Beijing's pledge to help African nations in industry, infrastructure, trade and investment occurred at China's biggest diplomatic event in years. Well, he's pledged to lead efforts to modernize the global south as they roll out tens of billions in funding in the next three years. Well, uh, let's now bring in Dr. Bates Gill, Senior Fellow for Asian Security at the National Bureau of Asian Research, and he is joining us from Geneva. Well, uh, good to have you on East Asia tonight, Dr. Gill. Uh, first, I just want to touch on the theme of a building building a high-level China-Africa community with a shared future. But uh, help us understand this. Can a shared future be achieved when one partner is this economic giant and you have the other as a continent that is seeking development? The, the term community of shared future is a sort of catch-all phrase that has been one of the signatures of Xi Jinping's foreign policy over the last many years. And it's simply intended, I think, to present a more benign, uh, cooperative vision uh, that Beijing wants the world to understand, and particularly the global south, to take on board uh, and, and, and try to find resonance in their common uh, colonial history. Uh, Beijing wants to African nations to find common ground with Beijing in sort of their joint um, uh, difficulties they've had with the West in the past and to so-called build this common future together with China, with, I think, China as a leading figure on the world stage. Now, on the face of it, uh, you know, Dr. Gill, we have got more than 50 African states against one China. But I guess the question is, how equal is this partnership and who is really benefiting from it? Well, of course, uh, individually, uh, no African nation can can easily size up or be equal, quote unquote, certainly in terms of comprehensive national strength than China. Uh, but China's trying to make the case uh, that the African continent as a whole, and that's why all African leaders, except for maybe one that has relations with Taiwan, are invited uh, to Beijing or uh, gathered together um, in, in, the in some of the previous meetings in Africa with China to show a sort of common uh, a solidarity approach. But of course, uh, individually, no, each nation uh, need, is, is, would become highly dependent, and many are highly, highly dependent on China for economic growth, for trade, and of course, in relation to, to debt. So China clearly has the upper hand. This is a classic example of what I would call a Sinocentric multilateral organization, where China takes the lead, in setting the agenda, China takes the lead in creating these enormous uh, diplomatic events, and individual nations have little choice but to go along uh, in 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 uh, agreeing with 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 this vision of China's. And given China's history of lending practices in Africa, right? How do you see this new uh, fifty-one billion dollar financing commitment work out? You know, like any concerns of debt threat for these African nations? Uh, of course there is. Uh, in, several, in several cases, it's quite serious, and Beijing understands that. Hence, uh, very little discussion, no public discussion that I've seen uh, of debt relief uh, or the problem of the so-called uh, debt trap uh, that Beijing may pose to certain countries. Um, this new $51 billion commitment, though, is structured interestingly. Um, about $30 billion of it, $210 billion renminbi, uh, is uh, intended to be credit. However, uh, the remainder, um, around 20 or 21 billion US, uh, is going to be in uh, forms of, of assistance on the one hand, um, which I take to be uh, debt free, uh, you know, supporting programs, technical assistance, military aid, and the like. Also, this $51 billion commitment, about 20 or 21 billion of it. Um, I'm sorry, around, around 11 billion of it or so is expected to come from um, uh, Chinese companies. So, you know, she's made this pledge, but it's going to be up to the companies in China to make those investment decisions going forward. Um, it may be difficult uh, to actually see the outcomes of those investments in just three short years, which is what the current $51 billion pledge is intended for.
Right. We, well, we can clearly see that, you know, China has invested a lot in this summit. They've clearly got big ambitions in Africa. But what, what sets it apart from other major players like EU, South Korea uh, and the US? And how is that going to shape China's future? Well, it's significant. I mean, $51 billion, if it's all realized, is, is, is going to be a huge uh, uh, step forward for uh, advancing some of the needs in Africa. China still remains the single largest bilateral donor in Africa uh, by far. Um, and so, in a sense, uh, the, the closest competitor, if that's the, the right term for this, you know, comes from multilateral donors um, like the World Bank or the uh, European Union. And of course, it's the same set of issues that differentiate the two, um, World Bank lending, um, uh, other multilateral lending comes with a great deal more of due diligence involved, environmental standards involved, um, workplace safety and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, important requirements are made around those other loans. Some even include, you know, good governance and maybe even some uh, efforts to try and instill greater democratic processes uh, in parts of the continent. So the, the, the underlying um, expectations of the lenders, I think, are different, uh, where Beijing, I think, is uh, much more willing to provide this kind of support with less attention to some of those other requirements that other lenders have. A great point you've made there. Uh, back to the Global South strategy. Uh, we know that China, you know, dealing with all sorts of global uh, pressures like EU and US sanctions, for instance, uh, plus US-led alliances, as you've mentioned, with all these uh, major East Asian economies. So how then, how effective is uh, China's focus on the Global South as a key strategy uh, to push back? Well, I think one thing we need to take note of in this recent summit is the emphasis that's being placed on one of uh, Xi Jinping's major foreign policy initiatives called the Global Security Initiative. Uh, and it forms one of the major 10 partnerships uh, that China is pledging uh, with this new uh, summit. Um, and we're going to see through that a enlarged security related footprint for China in Africa. That's going to come through uh, increased training of police and other security forces in Africa, uh, increased uh, exports of security-related equipment as well as military uh, items to, to Africa. So I think there we're going to see an expansion. And there, I think it's something that the uh, Europeans, uh, North Americans, uh, other Western countries should be following very, very carefully and closely, uh, because this is something new. In other words, in addition to the traditional emphasis on development uh, on China's part, we're seeing an increase in its interest to expand security-related activities uh, and cooperation with African countries. So that's something new, and it's definitely worth watching. And I think the West is yet to develop um, effective strategies to try and either counterbalance or at least respond uh, to these developments. And I will certainly be looking out for that. Thanks so very much for your time and thoughts, Dr. Bates Gill, Senior Fellow for Asian Security at the National Bureau of Asian Research, speaking to us from Geneva.